Okay, without any further ado, I'd like to get started, uh, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today for um, the first of a series of webinars, and uh, all of these uh, webinars are based around our uh, product offering called uh, CSI as a Service. This is where we've taken the traditional ITSM consulting model and uh, changed the paradigm. And rather than focusing on projects where we go in, do some work, and then we leave, we find our customers uh, would much prefer it if we hung around and, and we, we did work with them over a longer period of time in a coaching environment. And uh, all this is centered around continual service improvement, and we call it continual service improvement as a service. So this first one today is uh, what we call money ball for the service desk. And what we're going to be talking about is uh, making sense of all the metrics that are out there, how you can manage your service desk, and the power of a single value indicator. So um, presentation today will be done by myself, Jerry Geddes. I'm an executive consultant with Fruition Partners, and my colleague, Charles Cena, managing consultant. Charles is one of the top CSI people in the industry, so I, uh, I know you're going to uh, enjoy what you learned from him today. So a little bit about Fruition before we begin. Uh, we're in a unique spot in that not only are we a world-class ITSM consulting company, we're also one of ServiceNow's largest and most successful partners. But we, uh, we started uh, um, as a, as a ITSM consulting company in 2003. We're currently greater than 100 employees. Client base is around the, the globe. And every employee in the company is a certified ITIL professional, including the back office. We're famous for our CSI coaching and thought leadership. Our bench has some of the leading experts in this topic uh, in, in the industry. And uh, word is, is getting out that, that we have this uh, this ability to, to provide this level of coaching and, and the, the demand is, uh, is increasing uh, every week as the word gets out. One of the things we also do is we provide uh, virtual admin administrative support for our cloud-based solutions as well. In terms of our ServiceNow experience, we've been four years as uh, one of their largest partners. Uh, we've got uh, uh, over 10 years as a company in uh, ITIL service management and so on. And in the cloud space, we have 100 plus cloud experts. And uh, to date, we have completed uh, greater than 180 ServiceNow projects, and uh, we're well known in the industry for that. So today's objectives, what we're going to be talking about is the concept of money ball for the service desk, the power of a simple service desk score. There are uh, lots of metrics out there. If you go to the various books, there's you know, two or 300 metrics that you can pull, and you can write scripts to pull the data with, but it's very difficult to make sense of those. So what we've got for you here today is a way to cut to the chase, specifically service desk focused, and, and very, very quickly get a sense of where you are and provide meaningful information back to the business and to help you operate your service desk. And this will be made up of a, a number of KPIs. There's eight key performance indicators that we'll be talking about, and together they make your service desk score. And we'll discuss how to establish your score and get coaching on how to improve it. So the focus is on CSI thought leadership you know, we're changing the consulting paradigm so that uh, it's a teach-to-fish model as opposed to a capital project with an, an end date. And uh, the relationship uh, with your coach is part of a subscription, not just a, uh, uh, a single engagement. So today what we're going to talk about specifically is uh, we'll do a brief overview of CSI, Continual Service Improvement, what it is and how it works. And then we'll introduce you to this concept of a service desk value indicator, very similar to what uh, Billy Bean did uh, in the movie Moneyball, where Brad Pitt played uh, the character. We'll explore the eight compelling KPIs. We'll talk about how to establish your own service desk score. And then we'll talk about how we can help. We have a service desk jump start uh, that can uh, help many people that don't have the ability to do large projects. It will get them going very quickly and show you the immediate results. And then we have a promotion. Anyone who attends the webinar will we'll give a discount to if you're interested in the jump start. And then finally, we'll wrap up and uh, close the, the comments and answer questions. So at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Charles. And uh, please, Charles, if you could uh, carry on. Yeah, thanks very much, Jerry. And uh, uh, w welcome again. Um, so I'm going to just start off and, and talk about uh, the current situation. And, and if everyone can just sort of think about when you uh, implemented your ITSM program or your uh, uh, ServiceNow system, um, I don't know, 
how, how far back you have to think about that, but you know, just take a moment and uh, try and remember what were the reasons that you actually decided to implement some type of uh, ITSM program, some type of uh, service management application. And now, if you sort of think forward, um, uh, you know, uh, there, were, there were these outcomes that you sort of focused on. Uh, can you think about whether uh, they were achieved and what were they and whether they were achieved? And, and typically what we find is, is that there's basically these sort of two uh, dimensions here. On the left-hand side of the slide here, we've got sort of our time uh, invested and we invest a lot of time and resources in actually getting these service management systems up and running and our ITSM programs in place, whether it's sort of incident management, problem management, et cetera. And then on the right-hand side, you know, we talk about outcomes. And an outcome isn't really, you know, we want to implement ServiceNow. An outcome isn't that we want to have incident management in place. You know, uh, incident management is, um, is not the end result. It's going to, you know, uh, uh, influence some outcomes or some end results. And so typically we want to understand what were those outcomes. So normally when people embark upon an ITSM program, some of the outcomes that people talk about are things like cost reductions, service quality improvements, productivity improvements. And we use um, the, the practice areas, uh, such as service desk or incident problem change management, to help us achieve some of these outcomes. And then we have to think about, well, how well have we communicated these outcomes, and how well are we doing against these outcomes? And sometimes it's not really that clear. Um, you know, everyone's very, very busy, and sometimes we're so busy just putting out the fires, we don't have time to sort of take a step back and actually think about the big picture and say, are we communicating effectively? Uh, how successful uh, we've been, and how are we communicating to the various stakeholders within the organization how successful we've been. So in this presentation, we're talking about you know, Moneyball for the service desk, and you might be thinking, well, what, you know, what the hell has Moneyball you know, got to do with, uh, you know, has got to do with uh, service desk? And the big point here is, uh, if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, I actually so the movie was called Moneyball, and, and the basic premise was that the collective wisdom of baseball insiders, including all the managers, the players, the coaches, the scouts, over the past you know 100 years or so, uh, their uh, view of the game and the statistics that were available to them were actually flawed. Uh, statistics such as you know stolen bases and, and runs batted in and the batting averages you know typically used to gauge a player were really sort of relics of the 19th century and they weren't actually that relevant and so the big question was um, uh, well the the, the, the the sort of basic premise of the story is is that the Oakland A's managed by a guy by the name of Billy Dean sort of said okay you know there are going to be some more relevant analytics and statistics that we can use that are going to helpfully move us forward. And the big question here was that if you're the New York Yankees and you want to win the World Series, you can do it because you've almost got unlimited funds. But if you're the Oakland A's and you've got a limited budget, you can't possibly compete with New York Yankee money. And so you have to come up with an alternative strategy. And believe it or not, you know, this parallel to ITSM and IT organizations is really clear. The reality is, is if IT organizations want to improve and want to demonstrate incredible value to the business, which is in our parlance, sort of the World Series for IT organizations, you know, and we don't have uh, huge budgets to be able to achieve these things, then we have to think differently and we have to do different things to enable us to be successful. So the question that we're asking today is, if you want to win the IT World Series, but you have the budget of the Oakland A's, what are your choices? So we use, um, the methodology around continual service improvement. Continual service improvement actually gains your ITSM practice. And the reality is, is that when a lot of people implement ITSM programs, they always think about sort of reporting and continual service improvement as sort of the phase two. You know, we're going to get to it. We want to just get incident management, problem management, change management implemented. And then once we've got that, you know, we'll start, you know, improving. However, the golden sort of nugget that CSI brings us is that it focuses our limited resources, and the limited resources that we're faced with are really sort of time, money, and people on the actions that give us sort of tangible client-felt results. And so, 
you know, I love these chicken cartoons that I've got here on the right-hand side here, and I, and I can't tell you how many times I've been in meetings where I'm looking at the reports that are coming out of the service desk, and they're basically a chart, and nobody really understands what the story is behind that chart, and, you know, we're supposed to get excited about all of these dazzling uh, measurements and metrics. And so what we're trying to do today is to talk about taking the limited resources that we have and really focusing them on things that are going to give us the outcomes that we want. And if those outcomes are uh, service quality improvements, then that's what we're going to focus on. If the outcomes are on reduction in cost, then that's what we're going to uh, focus on. So ultimately, we're taking our ITSM practice and we're turning it into a story. Uh, and uh, you know, we like to call it a value story. And that value story basically uh, is a mechanism for you to communicate how effective the service desk is performing within the organization. So CSI, you might be saying, you know, what, what is that, continual service improvement? You know, it's kind of like a no-brainer or it's common sense. What I decided to do was to put a slide up here that will show you sort of the basics of the CSI uh, process. And uh, the, yeah, so uh, that should be up on your screen. So uh, this is kind of adapted from the continual service improvement book from ITIL version 3. We've kind of simplified it a little bit, but if you go into that continual service improvement book, and, and, you know, as an aside, I always said continual service improvement is kind of like the Rodney Dangerfield of ITIL implementations. It never really got any respect in ITIL version 2. And, you know, with ITIL version 3, all of a sudden it gets its own book and people are starting to pay attention. And in that book, you see this diagram uh, of sort of a, an adapted version. And it just kind of makes sense. There's basically sort of four or five uh, steps that we're going to sort of look at today. The first one is, you know, where are we now? Makes sense. We've got to understand if we're going to improve. We need a sort of a baseline of some of some time uh, some type, and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, look at how we're performing right now. We're going to capture it, and we're going to scope out uh, the areas of improvement based on what the data is actually telling us. Then we basically say, okay, so we know where we are. Where do we actually want to be? And so we start defining some plans. We then say, okay, we know where we want to be. We now have to figure out how we're going to get there. And so we have to establish some type of project plan or action plan and give out those tasks to various people within the organization. And once we've done that, we actually have to get there, which involves sort of measurement, monitoring, corrective. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. One of the biggest things that we want to see in any type of service management implementation is for people to be exciting on an ongoing basis. And there's lots of things in this world that are addictive and bad for you. But funnily enough, success and incremental success is addictive and actually good for us. And if we can demonstrate some small wins by implementing a CSI program, people get excited and on board, and it sort of snowballs and becomes repetitive. And before you know it, you're a high-performing service management or service delivery organization. Now, this is what the ITIL book gives you. And the reality is, is you can kind of look at this and say, yep, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, let's go and implement it. The reality is, is that there are some things in the background that you really need to think about. And this is a very busy slide, and we're not going to spend a lot of time going through it. But one of the things I want to draw your attention to is sort of this pink box. And one of the things we did is we took all of those boxes and we sort of uh, expanded them out. And so under sort of where are we now, we kind of like listed all of the activities that have to happen in the where are we now point. And then sort of on the bottom of this slide, you've got, you'll notice that we have this thing called a CSI toolkit. And we've created a whole bunch of uh, tools, collaterals, enablers that actually support the CSI process. And so you don't have to just sort of start from scratch. You can take a recognized a practical mechanism and just deploy it really easily within your organization. So we're not going to spend a lot of time sort of going through this particular uh, slide. The basic point is, is that there is a bunch of stuff that needs to be thought about uh, um, uh, to, to enable CSI, and, um, and uh, uh, this can be sort of more closely reviewed if you're interested sort of after the, after the webinar. So CSI is about incremental improvement. And uh, we want to improve. We want to measure how we are doing it. And let's just you know, have a look for a moment as to uh, what Billy Bean did with the Oakland A's. You know, I think that they had a salary of about $41 million, or $40 million, let's say. The New York Yankees had a salary of about $145 million. And it was clear 
uh, to Billy Bean that they weren't going to be able to compete looking at traditional uh, um, uh, measurements. So he was sort of a big believer in, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's called sabermetrics, which is a word uh, which I hadn't really encountered before, but it actually talks about the analytics and understanding of uh, baseball uh, measurements. And so what he did was he was looking at uh, different behaviors or different uh, KPIs that would provide an indication as to whether a player was going to perform uh, better. And so the basic point here is, is that if we want to get different results from our ITSM implementations and our ITSM practices, we have to take a different approach. And um, uh, the approach is that we want to look at you know, some of the outcomes uh, that we're trying to achieve and uh, whether the measurements that we have in place are aligned to those outcomes. So um, if we can just jump to the next slide for a second, I just want to sort of look at some of the things that are happening from a big picture perspective um, in the IT world. You know, when we're delivering service management solutions, we're pretty nested from what's actually happening in, uh, in, in the organization. OK, there it is. And, um, uh, you know, what I did was I, I put this slide together, and, and basically we have sort of some business drivers that are going on in sort of the, uh, the world. Everyone kind of knows about this. We've got economic uncertainty. Technology proliferation is, is happening, you know, more rapidly than we've ever seen before in our lives. Uh, the advent of, of, of tablets and smartphones is basically really enabling everyone to have a computer in their, in their pocket. And globalization is really having a huge impact on how businesses are actually delivering their services. All of those things that are happening on the business side sort of follow through and actually impact IT. Businesses in economic uncertain times are going to IT and saying, OK, we have to increase our efficiencies. We want to reduce our costs. And IT itself is going through a role evolution. You know, historically, IT was really a builder of IT infrastructure. And over time, it seems to be becoming a brokerage of IT infrastructure where you have various uh, services or cloud kind of services that are being run and the IT department has to sort of put them together and deliver a compelling uh, uh, value proposition to the organization. Nested within all of this is, our, is the service delivery, the service desk, and, and there's a challenge here, is that we have to, while all of these things are going on, still demonstrate our value proposition to the organization. And this really is a challenge because uh, we're so busy solving incidents, identifying root causes and problems, sometimes we just don't have time to think about, well, what is, our, uh, what is our value proposition? What are the things that are important for us to be communicating back to the business? And uh, even if we understand what those things are, how are we actually demonstrating them? I, um, I was at a, a hospital group in uh, California, uh, I suppose about six weeks ago, and I was kind of like looking at the reports that were being generated from the service desk, and they were being sort of sent out to all the different levels of management within the organization, and they would send out literally a book of reports. And you know, sitting down with the senior managers, and there were the CIOs, and the various levels of IT director, everyone independently uh, and privately had a little confessional and said, you know what, we're getting all of these reports, but we really don't have, first of all, we don't really have time to look at you know, 20 or 30 pages, and secondly, we don't really understand what it's telling us. And believe it or not, they actually don't communicate that back to the service desk because they, um, uh, because they don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. That, that's in that particular organization's uh, uh, example. So the service desk is really faced with this challenge of, of delivering value. The, 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 the next thing is with regard to um, how we report. So you can see that I've got a slide up here of The Incredibles. You're going to know from this presentation that I watch far too many movies. But the reality is that I was watching The Incredibles, and there was this thing that was going on. I was thinking, wow, this also really applies to the service desk. You can see that my, my life at home, my wife gets very frustrated with me if I actually pull out all these analogies back to service desk. Anyway, that's another story. So if you remember the, the Incredibles, if you haven't seen this movie, it's about a family of superheroes. And in that movie, there's this supervillain who basically creates um, uh, uh, technology with, with hero powers. And what he wants to do is give everybody these uh, incredible superpowers. And then his basic premise is that if everyone has these superpowers, then effectively nobody is super. So when we look at organizations, so they're saying, what's the parallel here? Well, when I go into organizations and I look at how they report, uh, basically the, the challenge that we're seeing is, is that uh, there's some 
much rich information being captured in our in our service management applications. You know, ServiceNow allows us to really capture absolutely everything about everything. And we can get into this mindset that if we're capturing this information, we really should be reporting against it. That makes perfect sense. If we're not reporting against it, why are we capturing it? Well, we get to this point where we're capturing so much information and we're reporting on so much information and we're saying that everything is important. What ultimately happens is we're saying that nothing is important. Now, if you're the service desk manager, you can go crazy. You know, generate as many reports as you want, you know, drill down into every minute detail regarding the incident or whatever it happens to be that you, you're looking at. But if you're presenting information to different stakeholders within the organization and you're presenting the same type of analytics that the service desk manager is consuming, you're going to have a bit of an issue keeping everybody on board. And so the first lesson that we learn you know, regarding measurement and CSI is that sometimes less really is more. And so we need to find a set of measures that can be elevated against other measures. A set of measures a la money ball that have really been identified that uh, are going to be slightly different. The next thing we can learn about measurement and CSI that's maybe a little bit different from, from what we do is sometimes it's really easy to get into the habit of, oh, can we just, uh, we'll just go back to Sherlock Holmes for one second. We're just, uh, we, it, sometimes it's really easy to get into the habit of, um, of generating reports, uh, sending them out uh, to everybody, and then not really having any next step or, or, or follow up. One of the things that I love about detective movies, uh, and again, I, I apologize for all my movie references, but uh, is that you know, Sherlock Holmes, when he identifies that there's a crime, he goes to the, you know, a crime scene and basically he's looking at everything that's going on. You know, where's the blood? You know, what happened here on the floor? Was there a murder weapon involved? You know, whatever it happens to be, everything is looked, at, you know, at the room. And it's not just Sherlock Holmes, it's, it's any police, you know, organization. This is how they do it. They come into a room and they're looking at the evidence and based on the evidence, they're going to make a decision to do something and they're really trying to tell a story about what happened. And believe it or not, the process on the service desk is actually very similar. A crime has been committed. An incident has happened in the organization. So it's not really a big crime, but a little crime. You know, and we need to understand you know, what happened. We need to sort of figure it out. We need to tell a story about why that incident actually occurred within our environment. And then what are we going to do to potentially you know, improve uh, upon the way we actually handled it? And so linking our measurement to actions are really key. So what do we do? Well, if we look at the service desk value proposition, the service desk value proposition is really about uh, two things, um, cost and value. If we think back to uh, before there were service desks, what did people used to do? People used to call whoever they knew in IT and you know, they would get a response. You know, people often like that because uh, they spoke to someone who was very, very knowledgeable and they got a, you know, an immediate response. So that was high service quality, you know, arguably, but you know, for, the, for the basic extent. Organizations implemented service desks because they were worried about the costs. You know, these people were being paid you know, large amounts of money and they were running projects and implementing new technologies and it just didn't make sense for them to be resolving simple uh, issues that were occurring. So organizations implemented service desks because they wanted to save the organization money. Without the service desk in place, IT was going to become very expensive. And so when we're describing the value proposition of the service desk, we really have these two key dimensions. We have cost. We want to be able to deliver a cost, uh, service desk cost at a, at a low uh, price point. And we have quality. And what we want to do is we want to understand the relationship between these two dimensions. And so if cost goes down, does quality go down? If cost goes up, does quality go up? You know, those are probably you know, fairly basic storylines. But if I was looking at developing an incredible value story that I wanted to get everybody in the organization excited about, I would tell a story about getting our costs under control while improving service quality. And so deciding on what you want to actually do from an outcomes perspective you know, is important. But when it comes down to it, when we talk about service desk value and the value proposition that the service desk provides an organization, it really boils down into these uh, two dimensions. So what we've done is 
we've accepted the value proposition of the service desk as these two dimensions. And what we've decided to do is to put a scorecard together that we could uh, create that could underpin our service improvement pr uh, program. And we're going to kind of like move away from generating lots and lots of reports. Not that you stop doing that. You know, these reports are really important for the operational uh, runnings of the, uh, the IT department and the service desk. But what we're going to do is we're going to choose a set of KPIs, seven or eight of them, and say these KPIs are more important than the other things that we're doing. And I'll kind of get to why they're more important in a few moments. What I'm going to do, though, is just walk you through the scorecard and how we actually build it. So the first column talks about the KPI dimension. Another word that you could use here would be the outcome. And so we're looking at quality-based outcomes and cost-based outcomes. And some of the measures that we're choosing are quality-based, some of the measures we're choosing are quality-based, and some are a combination of the two. The next column on our scorecard shows a KPI champion. One of the most important things when it comes to telling stories about the information that you provide is applying ownership to the measures that you're uh, relaying. You know, you don't want measures to be sort of anonymous and nobody really is responsible for it. You want someone to sort of hang their hat on it and say, you know what, I'm responsible for the quality of this measure um, and, you know, I, I'm so confident that, you know, we're doing something about it. I'm even going to put my name on the scorecard that's going to be distributed around the organization. So you can see here that you've got various different stakeholders and in an actual organization, you probably would, you, you're going to have the real names here. Uh, the trend. Uh, this is kind of like an optional item here. It just shows you some of the things when they go up, it's good. Some of the things when they go down, it's good. And so this just confirms that people understand that. And then we have the key performance indicators. I'm not going to look at the key performance indicators right now. We're going to do that in a couple of slides. We're just going to look at the structure of the scorecard right now. So if we just continue to build uh, the scorecard out, the next step that we have once we've identified the, uh, the KPIs is that we have uh, uh, an importance weighting. So we're going to take eight measures, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at those quality and cost measures, and we're going to say, well, how important are these particular measures of quality and cost to our organization? If our organization is one of these organizations that basically says that we have to deliver a service desk at the lowest possible cost, then we're going to add a greater weighting to our cost-based measures than we are to our service quality-based measures. If we're the type of organization where quality of service is most important, then we're going to have a higher weighting for our service quality than we are for our cost. And if we're an organization that really wants to understand that balance, we're probably going to weight the quality and, and uh, service quality KPIs a little bit um, uh, more equally. And then as we move along here, we've actually got our confidence rating. Now, what does that mean? There are lots of reports. In fact, some of the best reports in the world are not generated because people don't have any confidence in the value of the data. And unfortunately, because they don't have confidence in the value of the data, those reports never get generated because it's really a chicken and egg situation. So when you're creating your scorecard, you might not know where to get the information for your baseline or, or for your starting point. And so what you might do is you might identify those KPIs and you say, well, I've got no way of measuring this right now, so I'm actually going to put a confidence rating as low. But what this happens is you're putting a stake in the ground and you're going to show this to various levels of management and they're going to say, you know what, what do we have to do to move that low to a medium or that medium to a high? And then you have sort of an action plan in place and say, well, you know, we need to you know, uh, add a couple of fields to our incident profile or we need to have better access to our cost structure from accounting or whatever it happens to be. And all of a sudden, management becomes a catalyst for change within the organization and we start getting the information we need to provide value to the various stakeholders. And we talked about telling a story. And so the next three columns, my baseline, my target, and my actual performance, are really about telling a story. A story, as we all know, have a beginning, a middle, and an end. The value of stories are that uh, there's a narrative. And if something doesn't make sense in that narrative, it's really easy to pick it out. Often when I look at service desk reports, there's no story attached to it. There's no narrative. And so I look at a chart, and I'm just kind of like, so what does this mean? I see that the chart is a particular number, and it's kind of like trending in a particular way, but it doesn't really tell me where we started from. It doesn't tell me where we're hoping to go, and it's not necessarily telling me the drama of what's happening as we're actually getting there. And so in my scorecard, I capture all of that in, a, in, in basically three columns. I capture my baseline. So if we look here at customer satisfaction, we've got a baseline score of two. Uh, we've established a target of four, 
and our actual performance is 3.5. So I can very, very easily understand where we were, where we're going to go in this reporting period, and where we are today. And now, there's lots of values here, and I still want to make it you know, more consumable. I want to make it easy. I want to give someone you know, uh, not only a single screen, I want to give them a single number. And that single number will actually tell them how well we're performing. So let's just look at the next part of the scorecard, and we'll see how we do that. We take the actual performance, and we actually do a calculation on it. We call it kind of like a KPI calculation. And we time that by the weighting, and we get what's called a value score, or an improvement score, or whatever you, have, or whatever you want to call it. And that improvement score, value score, is out of 100. So you can see here, at the bottom, we've sort of totaled it up, and we've got to sort of 52%. And this is basically telling me that we're halfway, or just over halfway, of achieving all of the targets that we set out at the beginning of the improvement program. And if I'm at 100%, it's telling me we're hitting every single target. And if I'm at 0%, it's telling me that we're basically at the baseline. And so what we do is we take that number, and we plot it on a chart, and we provide that chart to various levels of management, and we can see how we're trending in terms of our improvements or value within the organization. And then finally, what we do here is if you notice on the final column, I've got this thing called tactical tree reference numbers. A tactical tree is just a visualization of a project plan. We uh, use them because they're more easily consumable by you know, management to understand what we need to do. But what we actually do is we link each KPI to an improvement project within our organization. And so you know, the references that you're looking at here are basically references to these improvement projects. And I think we have some screenshots later on that we can kind of show you what they look like. But it basically brings us into that police mentality where we go in, we're looking at the crime scene, and then we're going to try and tell the story, and then we're going to come up with an action plan of how we're going to either figure out who, who uh, committed the crime or to prevent crime or whatever it happens to be in the future. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to look at the data, and then we're going to create these action plans, these improvement plans against that information, and then it becomes this sort of virtuous cycle. These action plans get updated as our data improves, and everything sort of uh, gets reflected in, in, the, uh, in the scorecard. So that's sort of the end result. But you're probably asking yourselves, well, how do you come up with these particular KPIs? And you know what? I went for a, a physical recently, and I went to the doctor. And uh, you know, uh, there were so many measures you know, that they were using. I went for the blood test itself. And just when I looked at the blood test, and I got back that piece of paper, and on it, there were just so many numbers. And there were so many things I, you know, I really uh, you know, I really needed somebody to consult with me and interpret that information. And if I looked at that, if I, if I looked at that sort of blood analysis, and I said, well, you know, pick out, you know, two or three or four of the real biggies, and then tell me about those. You know, what are those 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 measures within sort of my my blood work that basically would really tell me whether I'm going to be around for a long time or I'm about to pass out in six months? So what we did was we created a, a major KPI relationship map. And each red box on this screen represents a major KPI. And we didn't just kind of like pick these out of the air. We've been collecting uh, data from hundreds of organizations over the years. And we've been looking at that data and trying to understand when we get changes in various levels of performance, what changes to specific measures had the biggest impact to perceptions of uh, customer service delivery value and the ability for us to deliver those services at a particular cost point. And what we found was that there were certain measures uh, above others that had the biggest impact to cost and quality. And so if you believe me when I say that the service desk value proposition is cost and quality, then these measures are the key measures that have the biggest impact to cost and quality. So let's just go and take a quick look at them. Um, we have client satisfaction. How satisfied are our clients? In gray, in sort of the gray boxes here, you can look at the influencing factors. So for example, client satisfaction, we've identified the biggest influencer is resolution at first point of contact. So we found that every time we solve more issues at customer first contact, and customer first contact can be sort of electronically, it doesn't necessarily have to be a telephone call, it can be done electronically. It's just sort of a single interaction. We found a direct correlation to customer service, and customer service actually improves. And so we include it on the scorecard because it is so important at influencing customer satisfaction. Then the third 
influencer to customer satisfaction is another KPI that we have is resolution to our service levels. If we're a more mature organization, we'd have service level agreements in place with our, our, our customers or our end users. Uh, and if we're uh, less mature, we're going to have service level objectives, which are sort of internal IT targets. Well, we found that there is a correlation, once again, to customer satisfaction. It's less than first point of contact resolution, but still significant enough that it should appear on the scorecard. And so as we improve our resolution to service levels, we find that customer satisfaction uh, creeps up. And customer satisfaction is ultimately the number one indicator that tells us that we're doing a quality job and you can see some of the influences on the quality side of my chart. We have things like training hours to impact first point of contact resolution. So we, uh, you know, we do things like we look at every single ticket that was assigned within the organization, and we identify whether this was a first level support candidate. And if it was a first level support candidate, we want to implement a training program, or we want to have documentation in place to enable the service desk to resolve this particular issue. The final sort of major KPI that we're looking at here on the quality side is agent satisfaction. So we're not only interested in measuring how satisfied our customers are, we found that if an IT organization isn't happy with their practices, their processes internally, they don't actually deliver a great uh, experience to their end users. And so if we want to deliver a great experience to our end users, we have to fix what's going on internally. And so we want to survey and understand you know, how satisfied the internal personnel are and make sure that we fix the big issues because we want them to provide a great experience. Now that's the quality side. On the cost side, there are a bunch of KPIs as well. And so let's just quickly touch upon them. One that everyone kind of knows about is cost per service desk contact. And I, you know, I go into a lot of organizations and, and a lot of people are really obsessed about this particular number and they want to get it as low as possible. And you know what? You can actually get this number pretty low if you really want to, and I've seen some pretty low numbers in my, in my time. But the question is, what's the overall cost of service delivery? It's just one number. What you need to do is compare that cost of service desk contact to your resolution cost per incident. Because I can basically have some pretty low cost bodies staffing a help desk, and they're just basically dispatching every single call out to my second or third line support groups. And I've basically got rocket scientists who are responding to those issues and we're paying them you know, lots of money. And so I'm keeping my service desk cost per contact very, very low. But my overall resolution cost per incident is actually very, very high because maybe we've got poor assignment accuracy. We're actually sending it to multiple groups and so we've got lots of people involved. And so I really want to understand the relationship between these two uh, numbers. Then we've got things like agent utilization. There are a certain number of hours in the day. You know, what percentage of the time are we actually doing the things that we should be doing? And um, you know, there's some influences here in terms of scheduling efficiencies, agent satisfaction actually you know, uh, impacts this. I was actually looking once at a government department, and they had uh, unbelievably, I think it was like 46 days uh, a year. Uh, basically because everyone was just so unhappy with how the operation was, was, was working that they had like sort of stress-induced sickness. So you know, agent utilization was incredibly low. Low agent utilization you know, gives us a high cost per service desk contact. So if we look at these influencing factors, you've got things like first level resolution. Well, if I'm able to solve more of my tickets at first level resolution, I'm going to actually reduce my overall cost of uh, resolution cost for, for incidents, so over here on the left-hand side of the uh, 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 chart. And what you want to note is that first level resolution is actually different from first point of contact resolution. First point of contact resolution or first call resolution is a quality-based KPI. You know, it's going to impact customer satisfaction. First level resolution is a cost-based uh, measure that's just saying, okay, we're resolving it at a, with staff with a certain pay grade. We're not, you know, escalating it out or assigning it out. So let's look at you know, a, a sort of a quick summary of uh, these particular KPIs and just make sure that everyone you know, uh, understands what they are. So we talked about customer satisfaction. You know, typically, most commonly, we're measuring this every time an incident is resolved. We're sending out a survey. Um, you know, there's some variations on this. You might also want to just send out sort of an annual survey, sort of asking people general perceptions about either IT or 
uh, the service desk and you get slightly different results and often blending the individual incident results to this sort of uh, once a year uh, a survey can be you know quite valuable you know first call resolution we're driving up customer satisfaction and we're really driving down support costs typically what we find is let's say my cost per service desk contact is fifteen dollars okay and let's say my cost per incident resolution is one hundred and fifty dollars so basically every time I escalate a ticket it's costing the organization ten times more than when I sold a ticket on the service desk and so it really you know, you're really developing a compelling value proposition and saying, you know what, we've already got these people, you know, 70 to 80 percent of my overall service desk expenditures are, are personnel. So I've already made the investment in personnel. You know, now, how much additional investment do I need to make to get these people to solve X number of calls more often? I probably don't actually have to invest very much to improve my first point of contact resolution, but it's actually going to have a dramatic impact in my overall cost of service delivery because my cost of escalating tickets is so high. So first call resolution is, is important. As we move on and we look at uh, some of the other measures, we've got service level, objective compliance. Again, we're driving up customer satisfaction records and we're trying to measure the percentage of tickets that are resolved within a stated resolution and, and fulfillment time. You know, um, we find that if you actually have service level agreements in place, the link to customer satisfaction is, is greater, but service level objectives you know, still provide that link and that's why this KPI is on the scorecard. We talked about agent satisfaction. We can't really deliver a great customer experience if the people who are delivering it aren't happy with how we're delivering that customer experience. Again, we're typically measuring uh, surveys. So one of the things that you can do is either do a once off, sort of once a year survey, or once every six months, once every three months, or when you close the ticket and you send out a survey to the end user, you could actually send a survey to the person uh, internally who, um, who resolved the issue. And you can basically just say, once this person has filled out a survey over three months, we won't bother them again. But you know, so that we're not inundating them with you know, hundreds of tickets a day. So that would be uh, agent satisfaction. And then let's move on from uh, quality to some cost-based KPIs. We looked at the cost per service desk contact. So we're looking to drive down the total cost of support. We want to optimize uh, the ability to process tickets at the service desk. So as we see our first call resolution or first point of contact resolution go up, we're actually going to be able to lower our, uh, our resolution cost per incident. You know, resolution cost per incident is understanding the average cost to resolve an incident from end to end. So no matter where it goes in our organization, if it goes to our outsourcer, if we have an outsourced vendor, if it goes to second or third line support, we want to be able to understand roughly what those costs are. And we have a methodology behind that will enable you to get that information pretty easily. Moving on, we've got service desk maturity. So service desk maturity is an interesting one because generally what happens is if you have a low service desk maturity, you've got a lot of manual overhead that's happening within the organization. If you've got a lot of manual overhead, it generally means that there's opportunity to improve efficiencies and you're probably spending more money than necessary to actually achieve a certain volume. And so what we find is if we can improve service desk maturity, we can actually uh, have more throughput with the existing resources that are there. Um, there's maturity ratings, you know, we typically use a maturity rating model out of five uh, relating to your service desk and incident management practice and, uh, you know, you typically would want to be at a, a minimum of a three, but, um, uh, you know, wherever you are, you know, there's an opportunity for improvement and create some of those efficiencies. We have agent utilization and agent utilization really allows us to drive down the cost of, of, of support because we're just going to make better utilization of the resources that we have. As I mentioned, you know, the highest cost we have on a service desk are the personnel. I want to make sure that I'm getting the best return on investment of that personnel, and agent utilization is the key metric that enables us to drive down that service desk cost of contact. So in a nutshell, you know, we've talked about the scorecard, and we've talked about some of the measures, and what I'm now going to do is hand back over to Jerry, and he's going to talk about how you can actually implement this within your organization. Thanks very much, Charles. That was very good. So, um, you know, the big question is how can fruition help? So uh, we, we have a coaching package which uh, is, in fact, a shortcut to uh, the, your very own service desk value scorecard. We call this the CSI service desk jumpstart package. 
and uh, this is just part of our Jerry, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. So everyone, uh, was that an incident or a problem? So uh, thankfully we had a quick recovery. So uh, so what we've got here are, uh, are three workshops. The first one, we set up the value scorecard. We agree on the KPIs and the weightings. And then we look at what you've currently got on deck uh, in terms of improvements and what you're trying to accomplish. And then uh, we, we create a core working team and agree to establish the scorecard, specify the metrics and the baseline. So. So in this first session, we're tailoring the KPI measurement dictionary. We're, we're defining the data collection activities and planning activities and timelines and so on. So the second workshop is the, the target setting and, and the scoping CSI, where we actually populate your scorecard. So we review the baseline and, and, and provide some analysis. We prioritize what's important in your improvement plans, which ones we want to do in which sequence and why. We uh, create the service improvement plan. And uh, we look at the tactical areas intent. What's the scope of the CSI activities? What are we working on? And then, of course, we also look at the management plan, steering status, report card review, distribution. So really, the second one is a, is a baseline analysis. And uh, we look at our KPI baselines. We look at our targets. We map them to the, the existing improvement initiatives. And then really what we're doing here is we're, uh, uh, we're preparing for, for the next phase. So the, the, the third step is, is, a, is a champion checkpoint. This is where we have a reality check of what's going on. What are we seeing out there and what do we want to do with it? We're looking at options to extend and evolve uh, the practice within your organization, and we agree on the steps. And the, the, the third working session uh, is really a one-on-one -on -one with your service improvement lead where we coach them through finalizing the tactical plan, identifying the tactics and the deliverables to drive the action plans, and then uh, we create the action plan and we manage it and, and, and the structure for all of that. Um, we establish our core team at this stage too uh, with a monthly performance review and we annotate the report card. What are we seeing? What, what do we think the reasons are for what we're seeing? What do we want to do about it? Uh, we, we annotate all of that. And then we calculate the value indicator and, and, and the annotated trend. And then uh, we also will prep for the performance stakeholders here such as the steering committee and the uh, improvement champions and so on. And this will feed into a monthly uh, service improvement steering committee uh, recurring meeting uh, where we manage the plan, review the performance, uh, trending, and, and, and we look at the various corrective actions on, on deck. So typically, the timeline for, for this is three months. And uh, within the first 30 days, you actually have your own uh, working scorecard. And at the end of the second month, you've got your prioritized improvement plan. And, uh, and then finally, your execution or your action plans and CSI so you can execute the improvement. And then this is also where you get your, your checkpoint and you determine whether you want to uh, move on with a coaching subscription or not. Our, our, uh, our experience is that once people get this pattern established, they, re they really find that ongoing coaching is the way to do it as opposed to a, a one-shot deal. So uh, uh, on that note then, I'd just like to uh, uh, give you some information about our, our CSI as a service portfolio or coaching services with you every step of the way. And uh, basically what we have is um, um, we are uh, putting together rapid assessments and roadmaps. Uh, we've, uh, we've broken the traditional methodology for assessing and road mapping. And rather than an intensive forensic audit, it's a, an interactive workshop format. It allows us to rapidly assess where you are and evaluate the gaps and put together a, uh, a plan for uh, the next six months to, to three years. And um, we can uh, evaluate the gaps, generate the scorecard, and put together a number of um, uh, deliverables for you. So we'll do a, a maturity assessment, a process maturity assessment. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do a crawl, walk, run roadmap. We, we take the, the various maturity levels and we break them into three major stages, crawl, walk, run. And the roadmap will cover the areas of uh, people and organization, process, technology, and CSI. And uh, once again, we'll, we, we work on the scorecards here. Uh, another element that's very important in this phase is uh, not only do we assess the maturity of your processes, we assess the maturity of your organization uh, because organizational change is so important. Uh, uh, we we spend a lot of effort on that. So the assessment um, also looks for uh, uh, organizational maturity and the readiness for your organization to deliver end-to-end -end services uh, across the various uh, uh, silos in your organization to, to create 
end-to-end -end service management. We also uh, we produce communication plans in, uh, in the areas of awareness, uh, training, and so on. So then the, the next piece, uh, this is one of the jewels in our crown. And uh, as, uh, as one of the top uh, ServiceNow integrators uh, uh, in the marketplace, what we have done is we have created a best practice accelerator, we call it, version of ServiceNow. It's a pre-baked instance with world-class process um, um, built in. It's 60, 70 percent done, and then what we do is we tailor it to your organization. So we are, we allow people to stand the tool up very, very quickly, get on with it, start pulling the data, and start populating their scorecards. Uh, the tailoring is done through uh, best practice workshops. Uh, the traditional consulting approach has always been that the deliverables of our documents. In our case, uh, we have the documents uh, that just come with the the best practice, the practice accelerator. We we customize them with the last uh, 30 to 40 percent that we tailor for you, and the documents are, are a byproduct of the delivery, not the delivery itself. Um, so basically, we we get you up and running and very very ready to go very quickly. We uh, we have two approaches for new customers. Uh, we, what we call the, the greenfield approaches are new to service now. We'll just drop our BTCPA instance in, and, and we just hit the ground running from that. Some organizations that have been working with service now a while um, have found that they've configured themselves into a situation where the processes aren't running as effectively as they could, or their the data collection is, is uh, uh, not structured uh, in a way that makes it easy to do CSI. So. We have an option where we can just drop our BTA uh, right on top of your existing instance and replace everything. Uh, for those who have had ServiceNow for a while and they're quite happy with what they have, we have a retrofit uh, approach also. And uh, what we do is we uh, we assess your current situation, create the roadmap, and then we determine how far off you are from our, our world-class BTA build and, and we'll uh, map your data to, to close the gaps. Most of the, the information that, that people are missing when we do this retrofit is the, the ability to track end-to-end uh, -end services across a categorization model that does not um, require uh, a mature change process and configuration management with relationships. A lot of people aren't ready for that yet, so we have a, we have a, a path to take you there. So uh, top left corner here, this is one of these tactical trees that uh, uh, Charles was talking about earlier. This is a, a strategic roadmap tactical tree where we, we break out the specific outcomes of what we're trying to do, what the tactics are, what are the specific activities, and so on. And, and we plot those back to the values. And, and this becomes the, uh, the material from which we coach. We, we basically coach you through the execution of the roadmap. We, we build your scorecard. We execute the priority improvements. And, uh, and, and we coach you through this rather than in and out. Uh, you, uh, distribute the cost of the engagement uh, over a number of years instead of all up front and then it's over. And, uh, and at the end of the, the, the day, it's actually cheaper to do it this way. So you get the full uh, um, reporting and analysis and action plans and tracking. Uh, the coach that you have works with the management team to identify discrete KPIs uh, um, for you that provide your single value scorecard. You get your, your value uh, indicator, your money ball. And, and we can do this beyond service desk. We can do money ball for ITSM. We'll baseline your KPIs and targets uh, based on your crawl, walk, run roadmap. And then the coaching will expand from uh, implementation consulting to help you re do your first cycle to the ongoing, how do we maintain the improvement. And then uh, as, as part of uh, the coaching subscriptions, we give you access to a, a, a dashboard toolkit that allows us to uh, drill downs uh, of trending data, Cognos type, um, uh, cube reporting, and uh, uh, the ability to annotate one-on-one uh, -on -one private chats with your coach online, and uh, uh, on ongoing self-surveys, ongoing maturity assessing, and so on. So it's a very, very powerful toolkit that, that you get with the coaching subscription, in addition to access to some of the top uh, CSI coaches in the industry. So the special offer that we have is uh, for anyone who signs up for a CSI Jumpstart within 30 days of this webinar, we'll credit 10% uh, of your Jumpstart cost towards a CSI coach subscription. So I would encourage anyone who is interested to uh, get in touch with us, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you more about that. And um, 
uh, in terms of closing comments, uh, what I'd like to say is, uh, uh, you know, for many of us here and many of you uh, that are participating today, continual service improvement has come a long way. Charles mentioned earlier that uh, from version two to version three, it, it's got its own book, and that's a testament to how important it is. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult. There's so many metrics out there. Making sense of them is not easy. So by focusing on the, what we call the critical few of the important many KPIs, we can get this focus and, and focus on the things that matter, such as balancing quality and cost. And then, uh, as you saw, by rolling these into a single money ball value indicator, organizations can track performance with meaningful data. So our, our dashboard toolkit allows us to, to provide an executive dashboard with the value indicator for uh, for management, and then they can actually drill down and take it to the uh, to the right to the ticket level if they want. This fully uh, fully uh, integrated seamless dashboard within ServiceNow. So at the end of the day, you end up with uh, true insight into the state of your desk, and you create the organizational climate for this ongoing cycle of continuous improvement. Charles mentioned earlier that CSI has to become a habit. And if you listen to the marketers and the advertisers, they talk about the, the habit uh, cycle. And there's, there's a trigger, and then there's the behavior, and then there's a the reward. So if, uh, if your trigger is that, uh, you know, that, that you feel like uh, you need something fresh in your mouth, and you pop in a piece of gum, and you get the tingle, then that's the reward. And every time you feel that you want to freshen your mouth, you'll grab the gum. The same idea. When, when you see these, uh, these incremental wins and improvements over time, the habit becomes self-sustaining, and that's the secret to CSI. It has to be an ongoing cycle. You know, we see all the slides, we, we, we read the books, we take the courses, but at the end of the day, it's human behavior, and to create that behavior, we need to focus on a, a way to resonate with people and create this habit. So uh, uh, I would like to, in closing, also say uh, our next webinar will be uh, a month from now on change management on May the 11th, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, how uh, we do it, and from the point of view of our CSI as a service uh, delivery uh, platform, um, it will uh, be an opportunity for you to join us and learn about this, our, our tried and true method for developing a more effective change practice. Uh, we'll show you how to enable rapid change for the business, reduce the amount of incidents caused by change, which 80% of an organization's incidents uh, roughly are created by incidents. So this, this be, presents a huge win for any organization that's uh, looking at this particular process. And so we'll go through the crawl, walk, run approach. We'll do an overview of change management. We'll talk about the difference between change management versus change control. We'll talk about how to establish change management as a, an efficient and effective practice in your organization. Uh, we'll show you uh, the best way to, uh, to lay out the process. Uh, of all the processes, change is the one that seems to become very convoluted in many companies. We we have a very, very good way to avoid that. And uh, we'll talk about the common maturity characteristics. And then finally, CSI for change management, how we uh, how we approach that and how the coaching model works on that as well. So at this point, I would like to uh, uh, address any questions that are out there. And uh, let me see here. So I, I got the questions about where everybody lost my voice as I lost my line. Yeah, so there was a question uh, asking about whether the workshops are uh, delivered on site or remote, Jerry. Uh, they're typically on site, but uh, whenever we travel on site, it's plus travel. So the cost would be according to your corporate travel uh, regulations, whatever they are. Um, we prefer to do them on site. Uh, we can do them remotely. Uh, but uh, we find that it, uh, we're doing a lot of things very quickly, the, that the personal touch is, is usually the best way to go. And uh, a couple of people wanted to know whether the webinar is being recorded as they'd like some coworkers to be able to, uh, to have access to it. Yes, it is being recorded, and it will be up on our website within a week. And I Anything think that else? is it. Okay. So uh, unless there are any other questions, I would just like to thank everyone once again and thank Charles for joining me today and uh, welcome you to this series of webinars. And I encourage you to contact us to talk with any of us about our uh, approach. It's a new paradigm. And uh, we're finding our customers are really, really enjoying this. And we'd be happy to talk to anyone about it. So, uh, so thank you very much, everyone.
And uh, our email addresses are there if you need to contact us. Uh, you can contact us through the website also. And uh, we hope that uh, anyone that uh, of your colleagues who wasn't able to, to participate today can check in later and, and pull it off our website. So thanks, everyone. And uh, I will uh, wish everyone a good weekend. Thank you.